Hello, welcome to my, uh, the folks that join me for my online service. Uh, yeah, uh, you probably wonder what in the world's going on. Uh, it's spring break, Easter vacation, um, and one of my young people is putting on vacation Bible school for the kids in our community. So that's awesome, right? That's totally awesome. Uh, so that's what's going on with all this stuff. So uh, so we are in part three of this sermon series, Bees Can't Fly. Um, today, we are talking about blind eyes don't open. So let's start with some Bible verses, right? Start with the verses. The, the verses are what's important, right? It's the word that matters. And I'm going to take off my smartwatch so it doesn't say something to us, okay? Um, Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things, all things are possible, right? Matthew 21, 21, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Right, and it will be done. Go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. Uh, and then John 14 is our, uh, you know, the foundation that we're, we're kind of building our idea on. It's an amazing verse. It's a, I mean, I hate to say it, preaching when I'm preaching. Uh, it's an unbelievable verse, right? I mean, it's just, it is a very faith stretching verse. I don't think I fully understand uh, the implications of it. Uh, I think as the church, we are struggling to uh, to understand and to embrace and comprehend. And, and that's why we're talking about it, right? Because um, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is who ha he has declared himself to be. You know, we are coming up. It, it, this is for Palm Sunday weekend and then Resurrection Sunday. I mean, so, so you know, we believe in these, these things. We believe in the resurrection, right? Uh, that Jesus came to the earth, uh, uh, that he grew up uh, as a young Jewish man and became uh, a young Jewish rabbi, and he taught uh, the way to eternal life, uh, that, uh, uh, that he was crucified and died and placed in a tomb, uh, uh, that he rose from the dead on the third day, that he later ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he is praying for us. So we believe some amazing, impossible things. We don't, we don't take that for granted. We, I mean, uh, you know, we don't ever doubt that, right? We're coming up on the resurrection. So here's this verse, John 14. And I'm thinking that the same faith we have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, the, the same faith we have to believe for our own salvation, let's take that faith and apply it to John 14, right? Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, right? Uh, and all of these verses I share with you, I encourage you to read it. Uh, the chapters because they say so much more than we have time to get into uh, together. So, um, did you know that bees can't fly? So we have been going through this whole thing. This is the third time, right? Uh, according to all known laws of aviation, it, it's from Bee Movie. Uh, according to all known laws of aviation, there's no way that a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. The bee, of course, flies anyways because bees don't care what humans think is impossible. Now, the, the deal is uh, at one time, the scientific community did have a hard time understanding how bees were able to fly uh, because it just didn't look like it should work. Uh, but as time passed and uh, our, our capabilities, our, our scientific capabilities increased, uh, we understood what made it possible for bees to take flight, right? It, it's something that looked impossible. Uh, and then they gathered some new data, some new 
information was made available uh, and now then they can explain you know why it's possible um there are things that seem impossible to us uh, something happens uh, uh we're reminded we have you know what we call a paradigm shift we're able to see in a, a new perspective that we weren't able to see from before uh new data is collected or discovered and then something that appeared impossible suddenly becomes possible, right? Something that was unbelievable, uh, we now have the power to believe in it. Let's talk about one of those things that happened in history. Uh, in 1954, there were 2 billion 691 million 979,339 people on the earth. And of those almost 2 billion, 700 million people, only 39 of them believed that it was possible to run the mile in under four minutes, okay? There was this thing uh, that the running community called the four minute barrier because no human being was ever able up to this point uh, to run a mile in under four minutes. Many people, right? Uh, most of the, the almost three billion people on earth, most of them believed it was impossible. There was a small handful of coaches and mile runners who were attempting to do this thing that everyone else said would never be done. On May 6, 1954, Roger Bannister busted through the four minute barrier with a time of three minutes, 59 seconds and four tenths of a second, right? Barely came in under the wire and uh, the impossible thing had now been done. I read an amazing article about it. I I'm just gonna read it to you. The writer wrote it better than I could summarize it. Runners had been chasing the goal seriously since at least 1886. The challenge involved the most brilliant coaches and gifted athletes in the world. For years, mile runners had been striving against the clock, but the elusive four minutes had always beaten them. They had never beaten it. It had become as much a psychological barrier as it was a physical one. The four minute barrier stood for decades and when it fell, the circumstances, un circumstances under which it fell defied all expectations of the best people in the running sport. The experts believed they knew the pre precise conditions under which the four minute barrier would be broken. These are the conditions. One, it would have to be perfect weather, 68 degrees, absolutely no wind. Two, it would have to happen on a particular kind of track, hard, dry clay. And three, it would have to take place in front of a huge, boisterous crowd so that they would be urging the runner on to his best ever career performance, okay? But this man, uh, Roger Bannister, he did it on a one, a cold day, uh, he did it on, on two, a wet track, and three, he did it at a small track meet in Oxford before a crowd of only a couple of thousand of people. When Bannister broke the four minute barrier and other athletes saw that it could be done, they started doing it too, right? 46 days after Ban Bannister broke the barrier, uh, a, a, the barrier was broken again, uh, a time of three minutes and 58 seconds. A year later, three runners broke the four minute barrier in a single race over the last half a century. More than a thousand runners have broken the barrier uh, that w at one time the entire world believed it was physically impossible. The human body was not capable of breaking the four minute mile barrier. How is it that so many runners smashed the four minute barrier after Bannister became the first one to do it? Okay, was there a sudden growth spurt in human evolution? Of course not. 
Was there a genetic engineering experiment that created a new race of superhumans? No, there was not, right? Uh, what changed was the mental model for the runner. The runners of the past had been held back by a mindset that said they could not surpass the four minute mile. When that limit was broken, uh, the others saw that they could do something that they previously thought was impossible, right? Some new data was made available to them. They had a paradigm shift that they saw that what was believed to be impossible wasn't impossible, it was actually possible, and that changed everything. Most thinking about strategy and leadership emphasizes the intricacy of business models, uh, revenues, costs, etc. right? Uh, uh, but mental models are what allow organizations and their leadership uh, to do things that only they can do, which over time shows others what is possible. Now, you, I know you might be thinking, who cares about the four minute mile? You need to be relating this to being a follower of Jesus, right? Because this is very powerful when you think in terms of following Jesus and Jesus showing us a what is possible while the rest of the world says it's impossible, right? They don't accept the limitations, trade-offs, the middle-of-the-road sensibilities that define conventional wisdom. In other words, great leaders don't just outperform their peers. They transform the sense of what is possible in their fields. And that's what we need to kind of make that connection with, with, with our following Jesus, right? That he transforms the sense of what is possible as we follow him because he said we would do the things like he has done. Okay, let's talk about something a little more meaningful to us than running fast, okay? Uh, let's talk about the 1500s. Uh, uh, let's talk about the reformation of the church uh, uh, and a young man named Martin Luther, right? Uh, and the 95 theses that, that he wrote and nailed to the church door. Uh, so there were about 500 million people on earth in 1517. Big difference, right? Uh, uh, and, and of those 500 million people, 499,999,999 of them, you know, that's an approximation, uh, believed that the authority of the Pope was unquestionable, uh, that to question the Pope was to question the Vicar of Christ uh, and therefore to question Christ himself. You didn't question the power of the Catholic Church. Uh, Okay, let's talk about Martin Luther's conversion and his life. July 2nd, 1505, Martin Luther was returning from his family home back to school. He was studying to be a lawyer. Uh, he was caught in a massive rainstorm. Thunder started rumbling, lightning started striking, uh, and uh, there was a lightning strike right that landed right next to him. Uh, Luther was terrified, got down on his knees, afraid of death, uh, and he cried out to St. Anne to save his life, uh, and he made a vow. He said, St. Anne, if you save my life, uh, I will become a monk and serve uh, the church, right? Uh, and he survived, and he kept his promise. Uh, he entered into the monastery, St. Augustine's monastery. So Martin Luther was a very devout monk. You know, one of his superiors uh, felt that Luther may have been too devout. Uh, and he was actually concerned uh, for the young monk because he constantly fasted. Uh, he would beat his own body to purge himself from sin. Uh, he would lay out in the snow for hours uh, to punish himself uh, for his guilt. Uh, uh, and so his, his superior, he was afraid that Martin was actually going to uh, die from his devoutness, right? And so to distract uh, Martin Luther from his guilt, his superior decided 
that he would train him for theology, right? So send him back to school. Uh, Martin Luther began to devour the New Testament, uh, particularly fascinated, uh, of course, by the writings of Paul and especially Romans and Galatians. He, he completed his formal theological training, but he never stopped pouring over his New Testament. And the more he read, the more he prayed, the more convinced he became the church was not teaching what the Bible was teaching. And since the word of God cannot change, Martin Luther became convinced the church needed to change. Impossible, right? Uh, I mean, at this time, this was impossible. You don't mess with the powers that be in Martin Luther's lifetime, because if you did, they tied you uh, to a pile of wood and they lit you on fire. They, they, they called you a heretic and it was over. Martin Luther wasn't the only person in the church who felt like the church was wrong, but what separated Martin Luther from the rest of the people in his lifetime is that the rest of them felt like this, okay? This is how, this is how the majority of people felt, uh, you know, that, that believed the church was wrong living alongside Martin Luther. They thought like this. What difference can one person make uh, against the Pope uh, and the Roman Catholic Church. It is the, the most powerful institution on the face of the earth. Uh, they thought like this, I won't be able to do any good. Uh, they're too powerful. If I do something, they'll just do something to silence me. They'll imprison me. Uh, they'll put me on trial as a heretic, and then they'll burn me at the stake. Uh, and so it just wouldn't do any good for me to act on what I believe in, even though I believe they're wrong and I believe that, that this is right and true, uh, it would be a waste of my time and a waste of my life uh, because it wouldn't do any good. That's how most people felt. So what separated Martin Luther from these people uh, is that Luther had read the story of Jonathan and his armor bearers, right? Two boys, uh, can't defeat an entire army. But if you read 1 Samuel chapter 14, you read a little story about Jonathan and his armor bearer who are so tired of their enemies, the Philistines, uh, that Jonathan one day says to his armor bearer, he says, you know, I'm sick of these guys. They're the enemies of God. Uh, we are God's chosen people. He says, what do you say, me and you, go over to the camp of the Philistine army and we surround them and we attack them, right? Two guys, <laughs> I mean, a 16 and 17 year old kid with swords and shields are gonna surround the Philistine army, attack them and destroy them, impossible. Okay, but, but Luther believed what he read in the scriptures. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. It's 1 Samuel chapter 14. I encourage you to read it, okay? So he believed that. Nothing can hinder the Lord, right? Whether, whether it's an army of us or whether it's only one of us, nothing can stop God from doing what he wants to do. What separated Luther from the others in his lifetime is that Martin Luther had read the story of Esther and Mordecai, right? Uh, one girl can't save an entire nation of people all by herself. Uh, I mean, you're talking about a woman living in a time when, when women just didn't do things like this. You could read it in Esther chapter 4, right? Uh, a, a young girl doesn't save a nation. That's impossible. Martin Luther read it in Esther chapter 4. Uh, Martin Luther believed what the scripture said. Who knows? But you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And Martin Luther said, that's what the word of God says. And maybe that's what God is doing in my life right now. Uh, and so on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his list of grievances to the church door at Wittenberg, the 95 Theses. Uh, and the church did put Martin Luther on trial for heresy. Uh, and they did command him to disavow his beliefs. Uh, and Martin Luther stood before God and the Pope uh, and the King and the councils. And he said this thing that brought 
fire to the earth, he said, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason. I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils because they have contradicted each other before. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God, amen. The church did not burn Martin Luther at the stake. Instead, God set Luther on fire with a holy boldness and fire broke out on the face of the earth uh, and that fire burned away the dross from the church and the Reformation was born. Uh, and the doctrine of salvation by faith through grace alone was restored to the church. The most powerful men on earth uh, were humbled because uh, a humble monk sat down at his desk and hungrily devoured his New Testament uh, and believed the word of God more than he believed the word of men and the words of anyone else. What happened to Martin Luther, okay? What is it that happened to Martin Luther that changed him and changed the world, uh, right? Uh, what happened was Martin Luther got access to some new data, right? Uh, he, he had never had access to the New Testament. All of a sudden now he is a student of theology and he is pouring over the writings of Paul and reading through Romans and Galatians and discovering it's not by works, it's by faith through grace alone. He got some new information and it changed everything. Church, we have the data, uh, but maybe we just need the Holy Spirit to, to reveal it to us in a fresh way, to see it from a new perspective that we haven't seen it from before. So it's impossible, then someone does it. Someone builds it, someone invents it, someone breaks the record. Someone stands up to Goliath and all of the sudden what was impossible is not impossible anymore. And the next thing you know, everyone accepts it, everyone's doing it, everyone believes it to, until the next impossible thing comes along. Right? Uh, and, and so the main idea of what we're talking about is, is how we started this thing. We already believe in the, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We believe that he saved us from the powers of sin, death, hell, and the grave. We believe the most impossible thing in the whole world. So why don't we take that same faith and believe verses like John 14, 12, and all of the other verses like them. Whoever believes in me, will do what I have been doing. They'll do even greater things than these. Did you roll out of bed this morning and the first thing you thought before your feet hit the ground was today, I'm gonna live like Jesus. I'm gonna do some stuff he did. Maybe I'll even do something more awesome. <laughs> oh man, I, I, don't, I don't wake up like that. I want to. So let's pray about this idea. Father, I thank you for everyone that's hanging out with me, uh, listening to the word of God. I pray that you do miracles, uh, right? Uh, Martin Luther got some new data and it changed everything. Uh, I pray, Lord, it, we have uh, the, the same data that Martin had. Uh, we have the same information. We need the Holy Spirit to, uh, to reveal it to us in a new way, to make it alive to us in a new way so we can see it and believe it uh, from a fresh perspective. I, I'm asking for that, Lord. Help us because we want to glorify the name of Jesus on the face of the earth. I pray for that 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so my intro was super long this week. Uh, I'm going to try to make my points uh, a lot shorter. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about one, a man born blind who against all the impossible odds stopped being blind. Talk about two, uh, going where we are sent so that we can see what he says. And then three, we're going to talk about some men born with sight who had no vision. Okay, so number one. Number, point number one, here's mud in your eyes, right? This whole, we're talking about John chapter nine, uh, the man born blind. So, um, I, and I encourage you to read the entire chapter. I didn't have time. You know, there, there's so much in that chapter that is just amazing. So read it all. I'm just gonna, I can only hit on some verses at this point. Uh, John chapter nine, and I'm gonna, they're gonna be all out of order, right? Because I wanna make some points. Uh, here's mud in your eye, uh, right? People say blind eyes don't open. Let's look at this. Uh, the, the man born blind is now saying this uh, to some people, some religious people who want to know what happened to you because this doesn't happen. And, and the man born blind even says, he says, no one has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind uh, if this man, Jesus, wasn't from God, he couldn't do anything. That's such a great testimony, right? Uh, uh, so good. Uh, I can't get, uh, like I said, I'll try not to get sidetracked. So, uh, impossible, okay? Blind eyes don't open unless, okay, l let's read some more verses. We'll, we'll back it up to verse 1. John 9, verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered them, neither this man nor his parents sinned, uh, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in this man's life. Uh, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Uh, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes, and he said, Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, uh, which means sent. And so the man went and washed, and then he came home seen. Okay, so, so here's the mud in your eyes. How is a man born blind able to experience something that no one else on the face of the earth believed would ever be possible? They believe this is completely impossible. Here's, what's ha here's what happened to the man born blind. The man born blind got access to some new information, right? Uh, he got access to a new set of instructions that no one had ever given to him before. And then he believed those instructions and he acted on those instructions. Go, wash, see. The man born blind met someone who saw everything from a completely, totally different perspective than any other person on the face of the earth, right? The man born blind, of course, ran into Jesus, and Jesus didn't see anything like the rest of the world was seeing everything. Jesus didn't accept the limitations, trade-offs, and middle-of-the-road sensibilities that define conventional wisdom. Jesus transformed the sense of what the man born blind thought was possible. It started with some instructions, right? Jesus said to him, essentially, go where I tell you to go, right? Uh, Siloam, right? Which means sent, that's important, right? Go where I'm sending you, go where I tell you to go. And then his next set of instructions were, uh, and do what I tell you to do. And if you go where I, I sent you and do what I told you to do, then what I said would happen to you will happen to you. Right? I mean, that's 
how it works. And we're going to connect point number two to this idea, okay? So same idea, just a new point. Uh, point number two, Siloam is a solution, right? And so we'll talk about it. Siloam is a solution, one possible solution, um, right? Siloam means sent. Go where I send you and, and do what I tell you, and then what I said would happen will happen, could this be why the church is struggling with the whole idea that, that we will do the things that he has been doing and we'll do even greater things than this? Are we having a tough time as the church because we struggle with following the leading and the instructions of the Holy Spirit? Because here's something that I know for certain. And now, I don't know a lot of things for certain. Here's one thing I do know for certain. It is the Holy Spirit doesn't always lead us to do things normal. And let me give you an example, okay? Let's say you're praying for a man that was born blind, and then the Holy Spirit tells you, now I want you to spit in the dirt, and then I want you to make mud with the saliva, and then I want you to take some of your spit mud uh, and I want you to rub it in to the blind man's eyes. Uh, right? I, I mean, if you are down at the altar and you get that unction during prayer time, you know, are you going to do it? I'm struggling with making the spit mud and smudging it in the blind man's face, right? I'm struggling with that. I, maybe that's why we're struggling as the church, uh, you know, we say, why don't we see John 14, 12 happening? Uh, and maybe it's because he tells us to go and we don't go. He sends us somewhere and we don't go where we're sent. Uh, and, and, or we get there and we don't do what he told us to do. Okay, but, but that's not the end of it, right? The spit mud isn't the end of it. Now the Holy Spirit, uh, you're praying for the person born blind and the Holy Spirit instructs you, send the blind person away on their own to go wash their eyes in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Uh, and now I'm arguing with myself, Lord, why do I have to send them away? You know, there's water right here. They can wash at home. Uh, why does he have to go to Siloam, right? The pool of Siloam was the starting point for pilgrims who made the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, and, and it was there at the Pool of Siloam that they would ascend a stairwell by foot to the inner court of the Temple Mount uh, where they would bring their offering to the Temple Court. Jesus sent the man born blind to a place where he would start his very own pilgrimage, right? But the man born blind was not going to ascend a physical stairwell to a holy place built by human hands. Instead, he was going to ascend a spiritual stairwell into the very holy of holies, right into the presence of the real physical living Messiah, right there in front of them. Siloam is a solution for our problem. We have to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do, and then we have to be willing to do it, even if it doesn't make sense to us. And, and let me just say, there's a good chance when the, when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something that it might not make sense. Okay, point number three. People born with sight who had no vision. Helen Keller said this very powerful thing. She said, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. The Pharisees could see, but they couldn't see. Right? Do you remember what Jesus said to them all the time? Hey, Matthew 23, 24, you blind guides. Uh, Matthew 15, 14, L leave the Pharisees alone. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into a ditch, right? The Pharisees could see Jesus right in front of them performing signs, wonders, and miracles, 
And instead of calling him Messiah, they called him demon-possessed. They got sight, they got no vision. In John chapter 9, the Pharisees investigate what's going on with this man born blind who all of a sudden he can see. Uh, how did it happen? What day did it happen on? Right? Because that matters, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> what day it happened on. Uh, they brought to the Pharisee this man who had been blind. Uh, and the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees asked the man born blind how he had received his sight. Uh, and he said to them plainly, Jesus put mud on my eyes, uh, I washed, uh, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said this, This man Jesus is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. And now, I would explain it to you, but the man born blind, he's about to get pretty up, he's about to get a, a little upset. He's going to explain it to us. Uh, they said, uh, he's not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. As for this fellow Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. Uh, and now the man born blind, his blood is just boiling because it, he was blind and now he can see. Uh, and and he, he doesn't hold back. He's not scared of these religious leaders like the rest of the people in town because he was blind and now he can see. Uh, and so he just unloads both barrels on these religious people. He says, uh, the man born blind answered them. He says, now that is a remarkable thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. He says, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man, Jesus, wasn't from God, he couldn't do anything, and he especially couldn't do what he just did for me. What's the matter with you guys, right? Uh, I, he said, I thought I was the blind one. You, you're the blind ones. John chapter 9. They're, they're, they're the blind ones. Uh, and, and uh, well, let me not get ahead of myself, okay? Jesus had heard that they had thrown the man born blind out on his ear, and when Jesus found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He said, Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus answered, uh, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I do believe, and he worshipped Jesus. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Here's the thing we need to consider about our own lives. Are we going to be the blind person that was given the power to see or are we going to be the seeing people that prefer to be blind? It, it, you know, this is our Palm Sunday service. I, I'm going to read the Palm Sunday passage because it connects. It just connects to what we're talking about. Uh, uh, it's Luke chapter 19. Uh, the people threw their cloaks on the little donkey and they put Jesus on it. Uh, uh, and as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Uh, when Jesus came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, uh, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Hosanna to the Son of David. Amen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees in the crowd heard what the people were saying, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered them, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, Now listen to what Jesus said. 
if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. If, if you could understand the new information that I'm bringing. Uh, I am bringing some data that you've never had access to, and only if you would see it. But now, it is hidden from your eyes because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Right? This is... This is for Palm Sunday weekend. Uh, Jesus is coming into town, and I want to hear, I want him to hear me shouting at the top of my lungs, Hosanna to the Son of David. You go back to the blind man one more time. A second time, they summoned the man who had been born blind, and they said to him, Give it glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And the man born blind <laughs> answered them. Oh, I love this. I, and I know you love it too. He said, uh, whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know. I was blind and now I can see. All right, church, uh, you know what? I... Uh, I don't know a lot. Uh, you know, at times in my ministry time, I've pretended like I actually knew something. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, right? I, I mean, I do, but I don't have the answers like just a lot of these fancy people have. Um, I haven't got any of this stuff figured out, okay? <laughs> but along with this guy right here, I can say, one thing I do know, Jesus has all the answers because Jesus is the answer that we are searching for. Right, so, so if you wanna see, uh, if you wanna see John 14, 12 come alive in your life, if you want Siloam, if you wanna go where you're sent, to, uh, so you could see him do what he said, uh, then, then I want to pray for you, okay? I, I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you for everyone that's made it this far. Uh, there's someone that's watching, and they want the same thing that I want. Lord, we want you. I don't know. What, I mean, I, I only know one thing, and, and that is that Jesus is the answer that I'm looking for. Uh, and he's the answer that, that you're looking for. And he is the answer that the world is looking for. That's the thing I know. Uh, and, and so I am praying, Lord, that, that we can see. Uh, we want to see John 14, 12. I pray for that new data, that new information. I pray for a fresh understanding, a revelation of your word that will Give us the, the power, the grace to see uh, something that we haven't seen, to see it in a new perspective, to see it in a different light, uh, so that it can come alive on the inside of us. Uh, because if we go where you send us uh, and do what you tell us to do, then we should see the results uh, that you said we would see because it's your word uh, and so we thank you for that. We are standing on it. And we believe that we are going to start seeing it happen. That, that tomorrow when I roll out of bed, the first thing I think before my feet hit the ground is it going to be today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some stuff like Jesus did in his lifetime. And who knows? I may even do something more awesome than that. Because he said that I would. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you for Resurrection Sunday next weekend.